Welcome to the Bayside Sermon Series Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Duckworth, Technical Director. This week, Pastor Ken and I discuss Jesus, the Son of Mary, from the book of Luke, talking about Jesus and the importance of how he relates to us as our Savior through his humanity. All right, this week we're talking about the Gospel of Luke and Jesus as the son of Mary, talking about the humanity of Jesus. Let's start with some background information about who Luke was and who was his intended audience. So what do we know about Luke, Pastor Ken? Well, we know Luke um, was a physician, a a doctor. Um, We learned that uh, from um, the book of Colossians makes reference uh, to uh, to Luke's profession, um, and he was also uh, a traveling buddy of the Apostle Paul's. Um, so Luke's gospel is the only gospel that has a sequel. Um, the sequel for Luke is uh, the book of Acts. Um, Luke wrote Luke uh, and Acts. And so it's likely that, you know, all of this was recorded. Uh, Luke and Acts were recorded um, after the events of Acts 28. Um, so sometime around, uh, sometime in the 60s, uh, 60 AD. Um, and they were addressed to a uh, Theophilus, and there's not a whole lot known about Theophilus. People have speculated, you know, is it a person? Or is it? And it seems, it really does seem to be that, um, you know, Theophilus is an actual person, but we don't know a whole lot about him other than it's a Greek name. And uh, Luke was uh, um, likely the only uh, Gentile um, author of any of the Gospels. He was uh, probably Greek. So, yeah, that's a little bit of background uh, on Luke. And I love the way Luke starts uh, his gospel. You know, he says, Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I've also decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. You know, so in all that, you see, you know, Luke... Um, his, you see, Luke took uh, went through great uh, lengths to make sure his gospel was written very uh, carefully. Um, he everything was thoroughly investigated. Um, he acknowledged that there were uh, plentiful other eyewitness uh, sources. So yeah, that's just a little little tidbit on the background of Luke. Yeah, Luke gives a lot more details, uh, which is probably because he's a doctor and more into the details. So some of those details that we get from his gospel that we don't from the other is this is where we get the backstory about John, the baptizer, and his parents, and what happened to uh, his father when he was in the temple, and he questioned, how is it possible that a man of my age would have a son? And then he's struck uh, speechless for a, a matter of months until John was born. Uh, We also get the story about at the birth, this is where we have the shepherds and the angels. We don't get the wise men in Luke's account. We also get the presentation at the temple and the interaction with Simeon. That's an interesting story that uh, Simeon was was promised that he wouldn't die until he saw the uh, the Redeemer, the Christ. Uh, We also get the return to Nazareth. So the story doesn't stay in Bethlehem very long. Uh, for Luke. Uh, so they, there's the return to Nazareth, uh, still no mention of the wise men showing up yet, and then the trip to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of the Passover when Jesus was about, what, 12? So there's a 12, lot of different yeah. details. Um, you know, Luke uh, does seem to uh, really show the humanity of Christ, which was what the thrust of the sermon was. Um you know, so a lot of those stories that are uh, that you could just see the the human nature of Christ being ex- expressed through uh, the trials, through all of that is so. Some of that is very unique uh, to Luke, and I think that's the beauty of having four gospels. And if we're going for the humanity of Jesus, I think it'd be easier to relate to the shepherds than it would be the Magi. <laughs> Yeah, that is very true. <laughs> be easier to re- relate to the shepherds, be easier to relate to a lot of the, the people that you see that Luke includes. One of the opening points that you made was uh, 
it, it came from the Bayside Statement of Faith about who we believe Jesus to be. And here's what it says. We believe that Jesus Christ is God's eternal Son and has precisely the same nature, attributes, and perfections as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. We further believe that He is not only true God, but true man, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Now, is, is this a common statement of faith among Protestant churches? Uh, this is a common statement of faith, um, yes, among, uh, among Protestant churches, um, especially amongst uh, evangelical Protestant churches, you know, just um, clearly emphasizing um, the Scripture's teaching on both realities, that Jesus is you know, fully God fully divine, but he's also uh, fully human, and he took on that fully human nature inside the womb of Mary. But this seems like it could be a very divisive statement, saying that Jesus is God. That was something that uh, we read uh, was one of the things that got him killed. And to say that he is on the same level of, of God, and that is not something that all faiths believe. Uh, we have uh, some that that elevate Mary. We have some that elevate the, the role of the Holy Spirit and all these things. But this is this is what Bayside believes, and we ha we need to understand that there's a whole community of Christians out there that we show uh, grace to. That some of this it will be um, something that you can say, well, maybe or maybe not. We agree. But we have to live and love each other, and heaven's a big place, and we don't know everything. But this is what we believe based on what we read in the scriptures. Yeah, this exactly. And that is, you know, and again, it's important to emphasize that this is not unique to Bayside Chapel. Um, you know, these are historically rooted uh, orthodox beliefs of the Bible's teaching um, on Jesus Christ. You know, so, so this is you know, this is not anything new. This is anchored um, in the earliest church. Yeah. So. So since we're dealing with the humanity of Jesus, why is it so important that Jesus had to be fully man? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, lots of reasons. Um, one reason is he needed to be a fully man to be uh, our, our perfect representative. Um, you know, the Paul talks a lot about in Romans 5, about the first Adam, um, you know, our, our common uh, historical ancestor, and how sin came through Adam. Um, but then Paul talks about the last Adam, the second Adam, um, being Christ. You know, so just as Adam was uh, a representative for humanity, so Christ is a new representative for humanity, um, sent to do what Adam failed to do and what you and I could never do. And that was to live a perfect human life. Uh, so he was sent as, it was important that he was human to be a perfect representative, um, a perfect human. Um, you know, we often say here that um, there was only one person to ever live the Christian life, and that's Christ himself. You and I can't live the Christian life apart from having Christ in us. Um, so that's one of the reasons it was, you know, necessary for Jesus to be fully human so he could uh, also uh, sympathize with us. That's what Hebrews talks about. Um, you know, he's able to sympathize with us in our weakness, and he knows all of our struggles with temptation um, because he himself was tempted in every way as we are. So from the sermon, there were three big implications about the incarnation of Jesus. No one knows what you're going through better than Jesus. No one lived a life worth following greater than Jesus. No one can meet your ultimate need other than, than Jesus. So let's look at those each in a bit more in depth. Uh, that no one knows what you're going through better than Jesus. He understands our greatest struggles, our greatest pains, and greatest temptations. And one of those pains that he understands very well that you pointed out was rejection. Uh, rejection is a huge thing for for us today that we get offended or we we feel like we're we're not uh, incorporated or welcomed into into a group especially in the church we see 
In, in a lot of places, there's divisions uh, in a congregation based on, uh, you know, there's friendships, there's there's things that people just naturally group together, but others that are not in those circles feel rejected. But Luke uh, records in chapter 4 that uh, when Jesus spoke up about who he was and why he came, uh, in verse 29, uh, that they rose up to drove him out of the town. They brought him to, to the brow of the hill. They, they took him to the top of the hill, uh, and they were about to throw him off. They were going to throw him off a cliff because they rejected what he was trying to teach. Yeah. And then this, this uh, very mysterious passage where it says that he passed through them, uh, through their mists, and uh, he went away. So Pastor Dave mentioned the other week that some people think that that may have been a, a metaphysical change or just a, a, a nondescript way of Jesus finding a, a way out in an emergency. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. I think it could be either of those. That's right. <laughs> so knowing that Jesus understands our struggles and pains uh, and our temptations, you, you spoke about that earlier. Luke also records that Jesus went out to the desert and he fasted for 40 days and then he was tempted with some of the, the most precious things here on earth. What were some of those things that, that he was tempted with? Yeah, I mean, he was obviously starving after 40 days of fasting. So first thing Satan throws at him, you know, is, is food. Uh, and, you know, Satan, what, what he's trying to do is he's trying to get Jesus uh, off of the Father's agenda. Um, you know, because Satan knows that all it would take is one sin, just one. That's all it would take is for Christ to sin once um, and uh, and everything would, would be lost. Um, and that brings, that's, uh, now that, that brings a deeper question, which I'll, talk about in a little bit, which we refer to as the impeccability of Christ. Um, the impeccability of Christ basically says um, that uh, Jesus, um, though he was fully human, he's, you got to remember he's also fully divine, so um, he was un, he was not able to sin. Um, so, And then people, then, you know, you follow that train of thought. Uh, if Christ wasn't able to sin, how did he truly then experience temptation like us? But we could, you know, talk about, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but yeah, so he was tempted <laughs> with, you know, food right then and there. And Jesus responds and, you know, man shall, shall not live by bread alone. Um, and he starts quoting scripture back to Satan and, you know, Satan tempts him with, uh, with political and religious power. Um, and, but Jesus knows that that's not the way, um, that the scriptures, uh, intended for, uh, Christ to rise to power and to do anything other than um, what the Father's will would be and in accordance with Scripture would have been a sin. Uh, so Satan is re- relentless in his pursuits of tempting Jesus, but Jesus is relentless in resisting the onslaught of those temptations. And what what I love about that too is, again, when I was a when I was a kid, I just always assumed that it was kind of like a Clark Kent type thing. Where he, you know, Clark Kent would step into a phone booth, he'd take off, you know, his his outer shirt, rip his his shirt open, and, you know, and then he's Superman. Um, You know, so all those uh, times, um, or all those times that Superman was, you know, doing something, he actually wasn't in harm's way because there was only one thing that could hurt him. So I kind of thought it was like that, where it really wasn't that much of a struggle for Jesus. But, you know, the reality is that uh, he was... um, he was tempted as we are and the way he overcame those temptations was not by you know accessing his divine nature but it was by using the resources um that the father made available to him the same resources that we have you know the resources of prayer the resource of of scripture um the way jesus knew the scripture was just amazing the way he must have meditated on it and and ingested it and memorized it um his understanding of it so thorough, so complete. And then he relied on the Holy Spirit to empower him. And that's how we're supposed to live our Christian lives, not in self-reliance, but in reliance upon the Spirit's power. So you see Jesus doing all of that through all the temptations. And it's such it's such a beautiful reminder um, that Jesus not only understands our greatest temptations, but he set the example for how we could overcome temptation as well. Right. That was the part of the, the second point that you made. Uh, no one lived a life worth following greater than Jesus yeah. because he set the example of perfect submission, perfect spirituality, and perfect 
servanthood. Uh, servanthood is one of those things that uh, many of us in modern America have a very hard time grasping. Uh, but Philippians 2, 5 through 8 was one of the scriptures you pulled uh, to point us in that direction that Jesus, uh, it, having that mind of, of God, um, here's what Philippians says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So for us to understand that we don't get asked to put ourselves in harm's way very often. Uh, as, as Christians, there are some missionaries that do go out into some dangerous places. Uh, there are some people who serve in in inner cities and uh, other places that there is some danger, but for the most part, we're asked to love our neighbor, uh, and that should not be that difficult for us. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, yeah, you look at at the length at the the, the heights to which Jesus from which Jesus, Jesus descended. Um, condescended to become man and not just any man to become a servant and not, you know, just um, a servant who would die a regular death, but a servant who would die the worst of deaths at the time. And that's the, de you know, death on a cross. So, so all these, you know, these downward steps that Jesus, that the eternal son took in Christ, um, in Jesus, in serving um, humanity. Um, that's a great example for what our service should look like. And that was, you know, during, What's interesting is that Luke is likely Greek, and the Greeks had this notion of um, the ideal man, an ideal uh, human, uh, and that was something that some of the Greek philosophers would write about. Uh, one of the things that um, was not considered a um, a virtue, uh, something that wouldn't um, wouldn't be considered a desirable trait, was the trait of humility, um, the attribute of humility, and yet that's exactly what. Christ is. So Luke is also presenting Jesus as, you know, this is the ideal man, not only the second Adam, but this is the ideal man that um, all these Greek philosophers um, want to uh, talk about, but it's in Christ. And this is what, this is what true sinless hum humanity looks like, and that's serving. So Jesus really does set the example of that, you know, we live in such a, we live in a culture where, that, that celebrates um, um, heroic uh, achievements, that celebrates um, you know, quick-witted uh, wisdom and 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 a great intellect. Um, you know, great will to power, determination. Um, but really, what Jesus teaches us, what his example shows us, is that we're actually most human—not in any of those things, but we're most human um, in our loving, humble, self-sacrificial service to others. Exactly the way Jesus did it. So, if those are the lengths to which Jesus came in descending. For us, I'm pretty sure serving and loving our family and our neighbors uh, and those in our midst um, is is possible and not difficult compared to what Christ went through. And the third point from the sermon was that no one can meet your ultimate need other than Jesus. And that takes a little bit of understanding of what our ultimate need actually is, and, and that's redemption. Uh, and so the points that you made here was that Jesus took our sinful rebellion and gave us his sinless righteousness. That's the propitiation. He, he took the sin for us and gave us a, a clean slate. Um, yeah, not only a, a clean slate. Um, you know, he didn't just take the sin for us and give us uh, a clean slate, you know, putting us on neutral ground. But, um, you know, Second Corinthians uh, makes it clear that, um, you know, it's a step above the clean slate. It's, an act, it's actually his righteousness that we get. And that he took our rightful death and gave us his resurrected life. Yeah, and I was we looked um, at Hebrews 2 primarily for that, um, but also Romans uh, 5, again, referencing Romans 5. You know, the whole idea that uh, through Adam's um, trespass, death reigned through him. Um, 
while much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness made available by Christ, um, will, will they reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? You know, so we reign in life because we get um, Jesus' resurrected life. So as we look back over those, those statements, what are some of the ways that we can know that Jesus understands our challenges and our trials? What were some of those scriptures that you pulled up for, for that? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, you'd mentioned rejection before. You, even his, his birth, um, you know, is, is in a sense you could see how they were, how, how Jesus and his family were rejected. You know, there was no room for them, you know, in the end. You know, what, what does that look like? I don't, that, I don't think that was, you know, an actual, like, motel like we tend to think of. Um, in fact, they... There was actually a word um, used for that when you look at the Good Samaritan, um, and the Good Samaritan, you know, pays uh, to keep to for the lodging of that person. There's actually a, that's a different word than used here for in. So I don't think it was that. It was you know, it may have very well been um, some families, but every, every it was it was person at the seams. Uh, Bethlehem was uh, because of the census. So everybody had to go back to their hometown. So obviously at this point, Bethlehem is seeing more people than they've ever seen. So people are probably, you know, trying to just fit wherever they could. And there was where, whatever, what, to whatever houses or places they went, there was no room uh, other than, um, amongst some, some barn animals. So even there you see an aspect of rejection. Um, you know, nobody could, could make room for, for Jesus yet. He came, um, to, to make room for us. Um, you see his, the struggle of, of poverty being born um, into that situation. Poor parents um, being born in such a time of one of the most uh, corrupt and uh, unjust governments with the worst taxes. Um, so Jesus understands poverty. Jesus understands rejection. Jesus um, understands betrayal. His best friend. Um, denied knowing him. Jesus understands um, loneliness. You know, he was he was out praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He really needed his his closest disciples to to be praying with him, and they you know, fell asleep. Um, so you know, they had t totally deserted him when he needed their prayers mo most. Um, you know, one of the twelve betrayed him for. 30 pieces of silver. So Jesus understands those kinds of struggles, you know, poverty, rejection, loneliness, betrayal, abandonment, all that. Jesus understands, and it goes another st a step above that. Jesus also understands all of our greatest pains. You look at the emotional torment that Jesus suffered. You look at the physical torture he had to endure. You look at even the spiritual turmoil um, and being forsaken by God that, during that, that ninth hour uh, on the on the cross, that ninth hour of the day, that Good Friday, um, when Jesus cries out and says, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" So Jesus understands pain the way any of us could ever understand it, and then some. Uh, so yeah, those are you just look at all those different struggles, all those challenges, all those trials, all those temptations, and, and Jesus understands. He gets it, and he wants to navigate uh, us through those. So it seemed like scripture is pretty clear that people didn't get who Jesus was. That's one of those points, the conversations he has with the, with the disciples. Who do you, who do people say that I am? And you know, some said that it was a, he was a prophet or maybe Elijah, uh, which is a whole other backstory. But we have that today. There's people who don't understand who he is or they, they've been taught things about who Jesus is that, that aren't true. And so... What what are some things that we can do? What are some things that we need to, to to have in our minds ready to share to help them to understand who Christ really is? I mean, I think one of the best things you could do is you, you point people to his own words. Um, you know, who did who did Jesus say he was? Um, you know, lots of people may say things about you, Marcus, or lots of people may say things about me. That doesn't necessarily make it true. If you're performing miracles and doing these um, incredible uh, works and, and acts and, and healing and casting out demons and restoring sight to the blind, all these things. And 
I want to listen to who you say you are because I want to know who you are. And in that case, you know, some of the most common phrases Jesus referred to himself as was son of God uh, and, and son of man. Um, you know, he, he talks about he, that he's, he's the one that Isaiah prophesied about, the one who came to seek and save the lost, that he's the Christ, that he's the Messiah. Um, so you look at all these things Jesus said, and then you have to ask, okay, so th this is who Jesus said. He said, he, you know, if you see me, you've seen the Father. So he's saying he's divine, um, yet he's also uh, is shown by everything that he does that he's human. Um, he's saying he's the Messiah. He's saying that uh, he could forgive sins. Um, all right, so then the question is, well, how did he back that up? Um, and ultimately, he backed that up through his uh, resurrection. Um, and if someone uh, predicts their own resurrection and then comes back to life, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to that person. And, you know, it's so these aren't fairy tales. These are, you know, historically documented facts written by um, multiple eyewitnesses um, through extensive uh, research and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And some of those things are still visible today. If you go to on a Holy Land visit, you can see some of the, the things where they believe certain things took place. Uh, Bayside just had a group of people uh, visit and came back. And uh, uh, the, the garden tomb was a very moving area for these people because it reminds them that no matter how bad things are here in life, that there is an empty tomb and there is a hope for tomorrow and there is a, there is a purpose to everything. That's right. Our big takeaway this week was that the incarnation is God's loudest declaration of love. Last week, Pastor Dave discussed how this moment in time of the birth of Christ, uh, this was the launching point for the plan that was only known to God since before he spoke things into creation. Uh, this announcement to the shepherds from the angels expressing this joyous occasion God moving the heavens to align a star at the exact time and position to alert the Magi. And, and that in itself, that's, that's a huge thing that we don't understand how things were moved in the cosmos in order to align these things. It's as if the universe was crying out in celebration. And one of the things that you brought up was a quote from Max Lucado. And, and I'm just going to share the last line of it because the most striking uh, thing to me uh, was that the, the quote was, Christmas is the time to remember that Christ not only came, but he stayed, he lived, he cared. And for him to come and see the world that, that it was and be treated as he was and choose to to continue on to stick to the the plan that god had uh, th that in itself was was a, a severe under undertaking i believe what i like to refer to as the the final temptations of jesus there on the cross people saying well if you come off the cross then we'll believe you I and mean, that would that have proven itself in in that moment to those people yes but that would have been disobeying god's plan and then breaking everything that jesus came to do yeah yeah that's that's uh that's absolutely right you know so when you look at the when you look at the incarnation you realize that you know it's all of it was you know necessary you know it's not the birth of jesus that we celebrate alone at christmas it's what the implications of that birth are um and then you see that and then you really have to just look at the life of christ to understand that um you know, and through all, all along the way, every aspect of Jesus's life, you know, God makes an announcement about his character. Um, you know, you, Jesus stepping down from the throne of heaven and adding to his fully divine nature, a fully human nature, Emmanuel, you know, God with us. And that's, you know, God, God telling us, hey, I'm with you. You know, you see, Jesus growing um, in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, you know, so uh, through, you know, through that, Jesus is, is letting us know that, hey, I'm, I'm one of you. Um, you see Jesus being tempted um, and overcoming that temptation. Um, and, and through that, you know, Jesus is telling us, I'll empower you. You see the way Jesus was, was rejected, all of the fractured relationships he had. 
Um, and, you know, Jesus is telling us th through that, I, I feel you. You see the death of Jesus and what Jesus is communicating through his sacrifice on our behalf is him saying, I love you. And then ultimately you get to the resurrection um, and you end, you, you can't but end on a joyous uh, note of hope um, because through the resurrection, Jesus is telling us everything will be okay. Uh, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult it is. And you could look at the life of Christ. Um, he had a, a hard, difficult life, but it wasn't just, you know, any life. Um, it was so much more and ultimately leading to the resurrection and to his ascension and um, his promise to come again. Uh, so we can be confident that everything will be okay. Great. So as we come to the close of our time, was there anything that didn't make it into the sermon that you want to talk about? Um, not necessarily a whole lot that didn't make it into the sermon, but I uh, was sent a question, um, from one of the sermon series, uh, groups. Um, in fact, if you're listening to this and are not plugged into a sermon series group, I highly recommend that there are two currently uh, active, one on Wednesday nights led by Jim and Patty Ron, and then one on Thursday nights led by Kim and Ken Guyberson. Uh, so check those out. Um, and jump into those uh, really opportunity to dive deeper into the sermon and the passage, and then also to do it in the context of community, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one life with other believers. So definitely check that out. Uh, but so I got a question from one of the small group leaders. Um, it was a series of thoughts. The first thought uh, being all descendants of Adam inherit an entity called sin when they are conceived. Um, the second statement, Mary is a descendant of Adam. The third statement, did Jesus inherit this entity called sin when he was conceived within Mary? Is the answer to that question yes or no? If it's no, then um, is it true that Jesus wouldn't be able to fully relate to the battles we have against our sin nature? Um, or if the answer to that is yes, then what are the implications? Um, so I think it's important that we say, so I just, well, I'll answer that. I think it's important that we say from the outset that Jesus did not inherit the entity called sin. He did not inherit um, a, a sinful human nature. And I think this is at least one of the reasons why it's important to understand the conception of Jesus uh, inside Mary's womb as an act of the Holy Spirit, a miraculous act of the Holy Spirit. You know, in some way, through this Holy Spirit miracle of conception, God was able to short circuit the sin nature that corrupts the rest of us. So historically, there are two assertions, really, um, that uh, Bible scholars or Christians, uh, for that matter, want to maintain. The first assertion being that, yes, Christ was genuinely tempted. Um, and the second, that Christ was also genuinely impeccable, meaning unable to sin. And this goes to a little bit what I was talking about um, earlier. So, how, you know, how can, how can both be true? Well, first you have to affirm what Scripture says. Um, and scripture makes it very clear that Christ, in fact, did not sin. Um, so he doesn't have a sin nature, but, and, and scripture makes it clear that he didn't sin. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.21, I referenced that in the sermon. You know, God made uh, him, Christ, to be sin who knew no sin. Um, you read in Hebrews 4, it says, Christ in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. 1 John 3 says, uh, references the fact that you know that he appeared, Jesus, in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Um, so scripture makes it very clear that there is no sin nature and that Christ was, was sinless. So the other thing then is looking at, you know, so the fact that Christ was impeccable, meaning he was unable to sin, but that is essentially irrelevant to explaining his sinlessness. You know, the typical train of thought is if the reason Christ could not sin is that he's God, then the reason Christ did not sin must likewise be that he's God. But that doesn't necessarily follow. The questions of why Christ could not sin and why he did not sin uh, really do have different answers. And I'll, I'll just share this, uh, this illustration. Just in trying to understand this, uh, imagine a high school student uh, who is incredible at math. Uh, major math exam is coming. Um, one for which the teachers allowed the students to use calculators. I loved when my math teachers let me do that. But the student chooses to keep his calculator in his pocket throughout the exam. He knows that if he uses the calculator, the exam, at least for him, would be a breeze, and he'd get a perfect score with no problem whatsoever. 
but instead he does all the equations, all the problems solving in longhand on paper and simply out of his head. He's committed uh, to working his hardest to ace the exam without using the calculator that's in his pocket. When the exams are uh, passed back and then eventually returned, the student's the only one to receive 100%. And then when a friend from another class hears that the student got a perfect score, you know, he says, well, of course you got a perfect score. But, you know, I heard your teacher allowed you to use your calculators. And then that student would, you know, respond and say, yeah, well, I could have used my calculator, but I did the exam instead completely on my own without making any use of it. Um, so then why is it that the gifted student in taking the exam could not have failed to get a perfect score? He could have used his calculator, which would have assured that he got 100%, but why is it that he did not fail to get a perfect score? It's because he used his head and worked hard. You know, so the presence of the calculator was irrelevant to the students achieving the perfect score. You know, so that kind of illustration there helps convey both the legitimacy of the distinction between why something could not happen and why it did not happen. So Christ was fully God. So as fully God, he could not sin. Uh, but also he did not, he deliberately did not appeal to his divine nature in fighting the temptations that came to him. And I think you could even go one step beyond that. So not only does Jesus understand all of our temptations, but he experienced his temptations um, to the fullest extent, more so than we would, uh, we ever possibly uh, could. Though Christ wasn't tempted through a sinful nature as we are, he was faced with the strongest and most relentless barrage of temptations. So that means he never sinned, which means he fought every single temptation, every single time, fully and experienced the complete unmitigated force of every temptation until he succeeded in defeating each one, every time coming out on the other side victorious over and over and over and over again. For those of us um, who do think about sin in our own lives, um, one of the reasons that we give in to temptation is that the pressure's off. You know, the pressure's so great that we want the pressure to stop and the battle's ended once we've given in. You know, so we get an immediate sense of release from whatever the struggle, the pressure of the temptation is that we're giving into. Um, but Jesus never sinned when he, when he was tempted. That means that he fought every temptation fully to the end. Um, and I think you also see that uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane as an illustration. You know, Jesus is praying three times. He's sweating drops of blood in agony, um, obeying the Father's will. You know, and it was because he had to keep fighting in order to win. His obedience was difficult, but he knew it was the right thing. So it, he, he, the fight had to be engaged. I think it's just more of a realization that we could you know, marvel at the fact that we have a savior who fought every single temptation, every single time, all the way to the end. And that's just another, another reason to marvel at him, to worship him, to wonder um, at, at this beautiful thing we call the incarnation and Christ becoming one of us. Amen. So as we end the podcast for this week, and this is actually the last one for 2022, we'd like to ask our listeners to reflect on the previous few weeks and answer these three questions. What new thing has God revealed to you this Advent season? How has God changed you in 2022? And what might God be calling you to do or to be? in 2023. We thank you for spending the time with us in this conversation, and we look forward to hearing uh, more from you in 2023, and we thank you uh, for your passion for Bayside and all that you do for us here. Uh, thank you, Pastor Ken. Uh, when we come back in January, we return to the book of Daniel, and we work on the last six chapters. That's right. Yeah. So uh, we're jumping into the last half of Daniel. You're going to uh, want to uh, stay tuned for that because the first half of Daniel, one through six, that we covered is all the narratives, all the really cool stories. To remember, the last half of Daniel are all the incredible visions that Daniel has, very apocalyptic, prophetic. Um, so uh, what do those have to do with uh, us in our times? And what, uh, more importantly, um, what do they teach us about God? Uh, so we're going to be starting that series uh, January 8th, and we're calling that series Undefeated. Um, you know, we're going to be looking at the uh, ultimate victory that's God's and that he, he 
has been undefeated, is undefeated, and will always remain undefeated. All right. Thank you, Pastor Ken. Yeah. Have a Merry Christmas. This has been the Bayside Sermon Series Podcast. Thank you for your time this week. Next week, we're taking a break, and we'll be joining you after the new year. Have a blessed week, and enjoy your time together with family. Merry Christmas from Bayside.